a car found abandoned on the side of a freeway and its occupant has still never been found. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Paige Runkowski. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> Paige Rinkowski was born on February 2nd, 1959. She was one of four kids in the family. I believe they were all girls. Her mom had worked in human resources at General Motors, and her father was the Chief of Enforcement Division, State of Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulation. Sounds like a very important job. Paige, as a young girl, uh, according to her mom, she would play with dolls all the time, and Paige had always said, she really wanted to grow up to become a mom. She really wanted to be a mother. And as she, every doll she got, she would name them the same name that she said she planned to give to her, ch her children at some point down the road. But unfortunately, it would only ever be dolls that she would get to do that with. Paige never had a chance to have children. The Rankowski family lived in Michigan. I believe they lived primarily for the most part in Lansing, Michigan. Paige herself graduated from Okomos High School in 1978. After high school, she would take on jobs like waitressing or working in customer service in some way, shape, or form, but then she would eventually go back to school because she wanted to get her teaching degree. She would have been, uh, by the, all accounts, by the way she, the people have described her, she would have been an amazing teacher, but that also never got to come to fruition for her. Paige was, they said she had a very bubbly, very outgoing personality, and she was kind of like the life of the party type of person. And she was also, she showed a lot of very strong characteristics of a leader. She had this, according to her mom, had this extremely bright radiance that really kind of seemed to infect everyone around her in a very positive way, obviously. But at the same time, she was also kind of like this really funny person and she just loved to make people laugh. She had a big group of friends and essentially it sounds like she was kind of like the funny, the funny one in the group. And a lot of her friends and family would describe her as a tomboy. She was a, a beautiful young woman. She at one point did some modeling. She also was a really talented singer. She did some uh, dancing. She was, <laughs> from reading about her, she sounds very multifaceted and there's a lot of aspects to Paige that there was, you know, if the teaching thing would never have worked out for her, there, it seemed like there was going to be a whole lot of different avenues uh, that she could explore and be very successful at. But like I said, um, none of that got to come true. Because on May 24th, 1990, Paige would vanish off the face of the earth. So at this point in 1990, she is about 30 years old. And she's actually engaged to a man named Steve de Brabender. According to some people, there were some kind of rifts in this engagement. Like there were some issues with, I guess, Steve that it, it wasn't uh, necessarily perfect. But by all accounts, the engagement was still on and there was still plans to get married. On the morning of May 24th, 1990, Paige offered to take her mom to the airport because her mom was going to be traveling to Atlanta, Georgia. So that morning, it's confirmed that Paige dropped her mom off at the Detroit Metro Airport. And it was about an hour and a half or so away from Paige's house in Lansing, Michigan. According to one of Paige's sisters, Michelle, uh, Paige was then supposed to meet up with a friend after dropping her mom off at the airport. I guess she was supposed to meet the friend in Canton, Michigan. And then when that was all said and done, her plan was to go back to Lansing to watch her fiance play softball. He was on a softball team. It does sound like she made it to the meeting with her friend. And then after that, it would have been about a 30 minute drive to get back to Lansing. But Paige never made it there. Paige was observed by 
witnesses, technically um, in the area of Fowlerville, Michigan, and she was driving down the I-96. So at some point that day, police there in Fowlerville or Lansing, I'm not 100% sure which police station got called. But at some point that afternoon or early evening, they got a few calls about a vehicle that seemingly abandoned off the side of the I-96. Police don't respond right away. As a matter of fact, it's not until about two or three hours after these calls came in about this car is when they would actually send someone out. And the car, when I guess they got there, the car was still running. There was a pair of shoes on the driver's side floor. There was a purse in there. There were like magazines and it just appeared as if there was no sign of a struggle in the car. It appeared that someone had just got out of the car and left it running, but no one was there. There was no blood, there was no, you know, hair pulled out, there was there was nothing that screamed to anyone that something bad had just happened. But with the car being still on and like shoes in there and a purse in there and no one else around, you would think they would still treat this as potentially like, okay, we might need to look at this as a crime scene. They didn't. They just had the car towed, and they and they and that's all they did at that time. They did find information in the vehicle that they can determine who the car belonged to, and that's how they found out the car belonged to Paige Runkowski. They left a voicemail or on her answering machine because, you know, they wanted to let her know, like, hey, your car's here, what's going on? But it wouldn't be until much later on that evening when Paige Runkowski was officially reported missing and when everyone found out that the car had been found abandoned on the side of the road. So police then bring it in to for processing, and this is now hours and hours later, after the car has already been handled by a tow truck driver and leaving whatever sort of evidence they may inadvertently leave behind, they examine the car. Again, after a thorough examination, nothing really major is found. I mean, other than the shoes and the purse, with her ID and everything, they th there's nothing else in there to indicate what might have happened to her. There was no uh, there's no damage to the car. There was the car was running perfectly fine. It had plenty of gas in the car. There was no indications that maybe Paige hit someone or got maybe rear-ended, pulled off to the side of the road to exchange insurance, and then someone kidnapped her. There was no damage like that whatsoever. No dents. No scratches. Nothing. And the car was fully operational. So when she, when she was reported missing, this obviously now said, okay, something bad happened to Paige Rankowski. Now, obviously. It kind of should have put that together from the get-go, but hey, who am I to judge? So now they are going kind of back and trying to find out Paige's movements. They're putting out information to, find, to see if they can get any witnesses who said they may have seen her. They confirmed with her mom that she dropped her off the airport. It sounds like, like I said earlier, that she met up with that friend. And then Paige, according to some witnesses, was seen sometime between 2.30 and 2.45 at a store that is actually now no longer open by a couple of different people. And that was west of Interstate 275 in Canton, Michigan. Apparently at that store, she bought some beer and that unopened beer was found in the car still. It was very evident to police that this was a confirmed sighting of Renkowski because she was wearing very distinctive clothing. I guess these like uh, with a very distinctive floral pattern pants. They were like really loose fitting and she had a very distinctive necklace that her family would all confirm that, you know, the clothing, the necklace, that was definitely Paige. And they showed a picture of Paige to this clerk and they confirmed that. So they know she was alive and well around 2.45 that day. Then witnesses came forward to state that several people driving down the I-96 saw a woman who looked like Paige Rankowski pulled off on the side of the road. They confirmed it was the same vehicle that was actually hers. They described the vehicle and it matched the description of her car. And she was seen talking to According, it really depends on, I guess, the witness, but some witnesses saw one individual, one man talking to Paige, and other people saw somewheres up to two or possibly three different men. All descriptions of the men were described as black males, and they were seen getting out of or driving a maroon-colored minivan. Uh, the maroon-colored minivan I'm showing here is not obviously the exact that 
exact vehicle. It's just a similar vehicle that people described. Some witnesses said they saw what may have been described as kind of like um, a loud conversation because Paige, by one account, was seen kind of like with this, her hands in the air, like almost like she was yelling at the person. But then another witness said they saw one of the men uh, kind of gently put his hand on Paige's shoulder, almost in a comforting type way. But nobody witnessed her being taken. No one noticed any physical like fights. No one noticed uh, any weapons, nothing like that. They All they really saw was Paige talking to at least one man, possibly two to three men but they did not witness a physical altercation in any way, shape, or form, and nobody saw her get kidnapped or anything. But like I said, there were, it, it, essentially it was various iterations of this of a similar story by many different people. But it does sound like everyone is sure that it was Paige they saw outside of her car and that she had been talking to at least one man who was driving a maroon colored van. That was pretty consistent. It was just sort of like some little details that seemed to change person to person. I believe it was that Friday that police would interview her fiance. And from what I can see, they kind of alibied him. They interviewed him very, very thoroughly. He did not match the description of the men seen on the side of the road with a woman described like Paige. And it does sound like they cleared him and they ruled him out of any wrongdoing in this case. When they processed Paige's car, they did dust it for fingerprints, and they found several fingerprints and also palm prints. However, they have, even to this very day in 2024, and it's uh, July of 2024, they have never matched anyone in the nationwide database, the fingerprints or palm prints. It doesn't sound like they really can tell if they're pages or not because they don't obviously don't have page so they could all be hers or if they are from her potential assailant that person has never been fingerprinted or palm printed ever many years would go by and they have gotten very little new information very few tips very few leads over the decades they've gotten somewhere like in the thousands of tips and stuff like that but none of them have ever led to anything actually substantial. I do know that at one point the family contacted a psychic, her name was Lisa Lockian. I'm not sure if the family reached out to her actually or if she reached out to them, but it, Lisa would say she received a message from Paige about what happened. She describes a completely different scenario not involving the description of the men that the witnesses actually saw. The psychic says that had gone to Canton to meet her friend, which she did. But then after that, she was approached or waved, flagged down by a tall white man with mousy brown hair who was driving an older pickup truck. And the psychic said this was a man that, sh that Paige had known and had met through friends prior. So she knew this man. And that that's why... She, when the man was waving that she recognized him and she pulled off to help him because she knew who he was. According to the message that Lisa was told by, I guess, the, the spirit of Paige, I'm not sure, the man then quickly grabbed Paige and forced her into his truck. And she says she has this vision of the man saying, and the psychic said that the man had then grabbed Paige's wrists and was shaking her and telling her to shut up, shut up. And then the psychic says, Paige responded to this man with, no, I will not shut up. She said, no, my voice will be heard. The psychic described Paige's behavior in this vision as being a very fearless individual, which by her friends and family would say, yeah, that matches her. That's how she probably would have reacted in this situation, very fearless. She would have fought, she would have done anything to get away from this guy. I believe police were informed about this psychic's information, and the psychic said that these leads were never followed up on by police. Police deny that. They said they have followed up on it. Some of the family and other people have kind of accused the police of not thoroughly investigating this case. And they called a lot of attention to the fact that the police did not treat this 
as a potential crime from the very moments that car was found. That they just looked at it, they didn't process it, and they just had it towed and assumed that the driver just abandoned it. They didn't look into anything. And that's several hours worth of time. They could have gone out to the, the side of the road. They could have branched out and started looking immediately. That's hours worth of time that whoever did this to her, if maybe he accosted her there in that general area, maybe they could have caught him or found her. Maybe he had time to hide her because they weren't looking for her at that point. Who knows? Police deny. They say we did everything we could. You know, it's a, a an abandoned vehicle on the side of the road. We see this all the time. There's rarely is it a criminal thing, but you don't often see cars that are still on with the purse and the shoes and all the belongings still in the car. I can understand if all of that was missing, if the car was turned off, if the door was closed and all the belongings were gone, I can understand it. But with all of that stuff still in the car and it literally running with the keys in it, that should have been an immediate red flag of something is wrong here, but it wasn't. Now, could they have prevented anything had they investigated this from the get-go? Who knows? You don't really know that, and you never will know that. According to some detectives, over the years, they have also gotten these anonymous tips. People have sent them these hand-drawn maps of where you could go off of the I-96 to where Paige was, where her body was, and they followed up on these maps. They've gone to all the locations that these maps have pointed to. They have brought in ground penetrating radar. They have brought in cadaver dogs. They have brought in just general search crews to walk on foot to see these areas. And they did that back originally as well in 1990. After all of it was said and done, they had people searching on foot in the air. They were doing all that too, but now, where they gave me these tips with these more specific information, specific places to look at, they would do the same thing again, and they've dug up places, they have searched and dug holes, and they've done all of the, everything they could think of, but all of these maps and all of these supposed locations where she might have been, they've never found her. They've never found anything to do with her clothing, hair, not, not a single trace of her has been found. Paige's case would actually inspire her mom to become an advocate over the years for missing people. But sadly, uh, her mom passed away, I believe in 2017, and she never found out what happened to her daughter. She never found her and never knew where she was or, or, or what exactly happened to her that day in 1990. And now her sisters, one of them for sure, Michelle, she seems to be kind of like the face of this, the spokesperson. She has kept it going. She has kept pressuring the police. She has gone on interviews, done interviews for like local stuff, and just keeps putting Paige's information and her story out there in hopes that anyone comes forward with information. But so far, as of me filming this in July of 2024, they've gotten nothing. Paige's family has sworn that they are never going to give up. That even if the passage of time goes by and people pass away from, you know, you know, natural causes, the next family member will just continue to push this until they find out what happened to Paige. Police are treating this as a homicide. They don't believe that she is alive any, anymore. They don't believe that this was a situation where Paige just walked away from life and did went on her own path. Her social security number has never been used. There really have been no actual confirmed sightings of her anywhere. There's been no supposed sightings. Like people said, I think I saw someone who looked like her, like, like none of that. But at the time of her disappearance, Paige was 30 years old. She was five foot six. She weighed roughly 125 pounds. She had blonde hair. She had surgical scars on the inside of her right arm and surgical scars on both of her knees. Somebody somewhere out there knows what happened to Paige Ronkowski. There's always at least one person. Think about it, there's at least two people. Paige, but she's probably no longer alive, and then whoever did this to her. If you believe the other stories, it sounds like there may have been more than one person involved in this, and that means more than one person knows where what happened to her. And maybe one or two of those people have died. Who knows? Could have been. But time and time again, you see stories like this where the assailants, the killers, the kidnappers, they have to brag. They have to talk about it. They have to tell someone. They get drunk or high one night and they, they spill the beans. And maybe they've told what they know 
or what they did to you. Maybe you're watching this video or any video about Paige Ronkowski's disappearance. It doesn't have to be mine. It can be anyone's video. And if something jogs your memory and maybe you're afraid for your life because maybe they said they would kill you if you told anyone. Or maybe you just didn't want to come forward because you were just nervous. Maybe you no longer are friends with this person or these people. Maybe you're separated from them now, and now you can come forward. And if you're still nervous, you can report your information anonymously. You don't have to say who you are, to say what you know. Send police a map and say, hey, I have proof of where she is, or anything. The smallest, tiniest thing, it may be insignificant to you or sound insignificant, but it could be huge to police and to Paige's family. They deserve to know what happened to her. They deserve to be able to bring her home and lay her to rest properly if she in fact is dead. Or maybe in that insane off chance she did kind of run out on her own and she's still out there somewhere, maybe you recognize her and you just want to tell her family where she is. That's probably not the case. I, I know there is always that hope. Until you find her, there is that hope. So... If you are that person who knows anything about the disappearance of Paige Ronkowski in 1990 from the area of Fowlerville, Michigan, you can contact the Livingston County Sheriff's Department at 517-540-7879 or 517-546-2440. If you have any information about the whereabouts of Paige Ronkowski, please come forward and help her family bring her home. And if she needs justice, please help her get the justice that Paige rightfully deserves. But that is it for this case, True Crime, Aruni Dooney Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, uh, please subscribe if you're new here. I tell many, many true crime stories here on YouTube. I have hundreds of true crime stories you can watch on here. Also give the video a like so more people see it, because again, the more people that see it means that, that one right person might see it and can help this family get their answers and get Paige home. I also tell short form true crime stories over on TikTok. I have a couple different pages. You can find the links to those pages down below in the link tree. And the links also pop up here in this corner at some point in the beginning and at the end of the video. So click that if you want to go check out the TikTok if you want. Also in the link tree below, I have a merch store, just like basic stuff like t-shirts and hoodies, nothing super fancy, uh, but we do ship all over the entire planet. So check it out. It's all delivered by Superman himself because he can fly to you immediately. I'm friends with him. No, I'm not. He's not real, Mike. I know. Okay. Anyway, what? Lastly, if there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a super duper quick email to my email address, which is also listed below. Just send me the name of the case or the individual where it happened and when it happened I will add that name to my list the list is over 6300 names as of right now um, I pick the cases I cover each time at random so I cannot promise you when I'll cover that case but I will get to it eventually I don't why the accent I don't know anyway okay well that's it mm. That's it for this, uh, that's it for this video. So. Okay. You can, you can go now. You can go now, you're free to go. Yeah, you're free. You're, you can. Please get out of my house. I will call the police, get out of my house.